Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still in Cambridge in Massachusetts. We are now going to be talking about the neural circuitry of emotion. We have Dr. Johan John joining us on the show. Hello. How's it going? Thank you so much for coming on. Greatly appreciate Pleasure it. Pleasure to be here. I'm super excited, super grateful to Alex K. Chen for introducing us. This conversation is going to be lit. I'm very excited. Johan's background, he's a research scientist at Boston University focused on the neurobiology of cognitive emotional interaction. He develops computational models that investigate emotion related disorders. And you can find the links below to Neurologism dot com as well as Quora dot com his profile there and on his Twitter profile as well and you've been very active on Quora your research is very interesting I'm super pumped to talk about the amygdala interacting with other brain regions computational psychiatry um, disorders we're gonna be jumping into all of that let's start things off Johan with what we love asking our guests about their perspective on the current state of humanity so yeah, uh, this is a hard question, uh, but at the same time, I guess uh, the, the, the first answer I would give is probably what a lot of people have said to you. It, there's a mix, of, it's almost like we live in a mix of a dystopia and a utopia. Uh, when you look at the technology, it seems like we're in some kind of Star Trek future already. Uh, but at the same time, when you read the news, if, if you're punishing yourself by reading the news, then it does seem quite dystopic. So I guess the term is heterotopia. The, the future is here, it's just not distributed evenly. So that is kind of an opportunity. Like there's a sense in which uh, things are going very badly in many parts of the world. And also sort of on the inside, there's a lot of anxiety and depression and you know worry of various sorts. So you could even say that the world is in a state of anxiety. <laughs> uh, and um, based on maybe some research that we can talk about, you could say that anxiety at least some versions of it, involve being aware of problems and aware of possible actions that could solve them, but not decisively taking any action on any of them because you're never forced to make a decision. Humanity seems to be in this state. We, there's looming problems, but is, do we have to decide now? Can we wait? <laughs> I mean, with global warming being the cartoon example, people are like, well, maybe we can let the next generation deal with it. Seems to be the answer of a lot of people. Uh, and I think across the board, there's this like there's all these opportunities to do things, but should we do them or just have fun? <laughs> wow, what a powerful synthesis! Yeah, the future is not evenly distributed, but it's here. There's this there's this uh, a utopic technological haven that we live in at the same time a uh, dystopic um, so many looming problems that we're kind of pushing off uh, to see how long we can keep the, <laughs> keep it rolling until we have to actually problem take care of it. I like that idea of the earth being in a state of uh, like kind of like anxiety or uh, in a sense it's also we've had, we have a lot of uh, uh, transgenerational traumas that have built up as well that we need to you know be honest about have discourse about reparations where needed integrate that trauma into us and move forward and and many Anyways, we haven't done that um, for so many things. So that was that was very well synthesized. And okay, let's do the journey of how Johan John became who he is today. You were born in India. Yes, I was. And then you ended up coming to Boston and pursuing your PhDs here. So tell us about this, where you're born and this transition to Boston. So I, I grew up in India, but I also grew up in the U.S. So my parents were uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, right before I was born. They moved here in 1980. I was born in 83. And uh, my, we, my mother was back in India when I was born. And then for the first nine years of my life, uh, I was in the U.S., uh, first in New Jersey and then in Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, then my family moved back to India. So I was there until... 2006. So in college, I studied physics, mm -hmm. and I also did a master's in physics. Uh, and at the time, I hadn't really heard of neuroscience. I, I didn't know that that was a word. I knew about neurology, and I figured that that was a medical field. And uh, those days, neuroscience wasn't in the newspapers like it is now, every day almost. Uh, and during my master's program, I was looking at a list of possible summer projects because uh, the standard thing to do was do a summer project, get recommendation letters, get a little research experience. 
Um, and I, I, I always liked using mathematics to solve problems, uh, but I didn't have a strong passion within physics. I, I liked just using the tools. Uh, my favorite field for a while was just mathematical physics. Um, and uh, so I was looking at this long list and there were these, all these topics, they all sounded okay. And then there was a topic, neural networks. And I was like, hmm, I, I didn't know physicists studied the brain. So I asked a professor that I was close to, what is this? <laughs> um, and he says, oh, it's a really interesting topic. Uh, physicists do a lot in there. And he had a friend uh, in Madras, Chennai, uh, who was uh, studying neural networks. So he said, do a summer project with him. Wow. Uh, and uh, it was a very interesting summer project. I mostly just read papers and uh, I, I did a little bit of coding. Um, but I was quite inspired by this field. Uh, it seemed to tie so many things together. I could use math and coding, which I just like doing. Um, and you, you get to study humans and animals and also, you know, uh, deal with philosophical questions without having to get bogged down. Um, so I thought, well, this is the best thing I could possibly do. And I don't have to compete with any of my classmates for applications to grad school because no one else was doing neuroscience those days. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I applied. I, I, uh, I'm just by fluke, I met someone uh, in my pro, uh, who was d taking a course with me who heard I was applying for grad school uh, in computational neuroscience. And he said, oh, I, there's this department in Boston University, which I hadn't, wasn't considering at the time, wow. cognitive and neural systems. So I, and he said, that'll be perfect for you. And uh, it worked out really well. I applied there and uh, got in. And uh, it, it was a v unfortunately, the department doesn't exist anymore, but it was a unique department. It was uh, a standalone department devoted to neural modeling. So it was a, a building full of theoreticians and modelers yes. and uh, drawn from all kinds of backgrounds. There were people from physics and math, computer science, uh, engineering, biology, psychology. There was one student who had a theology background. So yeah. it was great. Uh, interdisciplinary work, it can be frustrating, but it's also uh, um, sometimes the friction produces too more heat than light, but when it produces light, it's great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I start, started uh, in 2006 here at uh, BU. And my thesis was on um, timed behavior. So how humans and animals can anticipate something that's going to happen in a minute or two minutes and sort of uh, time their behavior accordingly. Uh, and that involves, uh, and also how that kind of behavior can be modulated by uh, drugs that influence dopamine and acetylcholine. And you can model what's happening in the mind and the brain as they're predicting that in a minute Something's, something's gonna happen. happen. In, in the case it's a rat saying, oh well, in, in a minute the lever will give me food. So there's no other cue in the environment, so the rat has to produce an internal representation uh, of the time. What's going on in the rat's mind is you know, a philosophical question, as I said, but we can study the behavior and, and look at uh, which brain areas are involved. And which it, ones? This is, this is so um, there's a, a region below the cortex called the basal ganglia, which is a set of regions uh, subcortical regions that's very involved in uh, a, a lot of voluntary behavior and, and uh, learning. And so the basal ganglia circuit uh, seems to be crucial and also cortical input uh, to, to that area. Um, so, and dopamine can kind of speed up and slow down an internal clock in one way and acetylcholine drugs can do a similar thing in a slightly different way. So my model uh, uh, that I developed over the course of my thesis um, looked into how that kind of modulation can happen. Interesting, so was the neuromodulation potentially had an uptick as the reward was about to come, and then it... So there's that, the, there's definitely, uh, so you, you may have heard about how dopamine is involved in reward prediction mm -hmm. and reward prediction errors. So less known is that dopamine also has a kind of invigorating uh, effect on just motor behavior. You need a little bit of dopamine in order to do, uh, initiate actions. And that's why uh, when certain dopamine cells uh, are damaged, Parkinson's disease arises, which is often a difficulty to initiate and sustain movements. So it seems as though this motor effect of dopamine is why you have this speed up and slow down. So basically, dopamine agonists um, like um, amphetamine or methamphetamine or cocaine can temporarily speed up the internal clock. So you know, it's called speed for a reason. And, even for rats, it's, it's speed. Um, and uh, so what you see is that temporarily the rats will respond 
as if time is going faster subjectively, so they'll respond early. But over time, if, if they're kind of running multiple trials of this, you know, one minute later, a reward arrives, they learn to correct. So they compensate for that shift. And what's really fascinating is then if you take the animal off the drug, you see a bounce back effect in the opposite direction. So their clock slows down mm -hmm. again temporarily and they compensate mm -hmm. and get back to normal. With the acetylcholine drugs, you have a complementary effect. You apply the drug, initially nothing happens. And then slowly over multiple trials, you see a permanent shift in the uh, clock time. So there's a sort of stable delay which doesn't get compensated for. And again, uh, it works in both directions, slowing and speeding, depending on the kind of drug. So that's an interesting mm -hmm. uh, phenomenon, call, really calls for a model. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was... Uh, so you're doing a lot of modeling. Um, and when this is also, I just wanted to also uh, give a big you know, shout out to um, the, these, these mentors or role models or, um, that we have in our lives that kind of uh, nudge us in a certain direction that basically open up so many doors and so much of our, in, that becomes our life interests thanks to the little nudges of, yeah, there is neuroscience. Go and uh, check it out for a summer, it's and then so all of a true. sudden, boom! You you know explode and in, into it for yeah. a decade. The you know. just the the few months before I decided to take up neuroscience, maybe my dad attended a talk by V. S. Ramachandran in India, and uh, so his his brother-in-law is a neurosurgeon and invited him. Why don't you come along for this talk? And my dad was like, What do I know about neuro? But he went, and and he was blown away by it. And he was ask, he asked me, a first year student in a master's program in physics, is there any way that you could get involved in studying the brain? And I was like, no, I don't think so. It seems pretty far from my, my world. And there I am a few months later <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. In, cool. uh, in a neuroscience pro, um, project and reading V.S. Ramachandran's book, yeah. Phantoms in the Brain. Okay, yeah. all right. So then that takes us to um, you, your thesis and PhD work, mm -hmm. and then that ended around 2011. 11, yeah. 2011, okay. And then, um, okay, so now I want to hit on the, the sort of interest in, you know, the neural systems lab and mm -hmm. emotion and cognition and how, what the, how the amygdala interfaces with the other brain regions. So take us down this, this path. So I work as a computational modeler in uh, a neuroanatomy lab and what we do is we, uh, my, my colleagues look at the connections between different uh, brain areas in uh, the rhesus macaque brain. So, uh, so it's like a nice intermediary between a lot of studies involve rodents, mice and, and rats and they're quite far away from humans. Um, and then you have human studies which uh, are very useful but kind of much more fuzzy in resolution. So studying in monkeys is important to kind of understand the structure in detail for a brain that's closer to a human brain. And over the past few years, we've, uh, my lab's been uh, focusing more and more on the limbic parts of the prefrontal cortex and the subcortical areas that interface with those areas. So a lot of people think of the prefrontal cortex as this one monolithic new part of the brain, but it's not really. It's, it's uh, of quite a... Uh, differentiated part of the brain. So you have near the middle of the, of the brain and on, on the underside you have what, what might be described as simpler and potentially more ancient uh, brain structures which have uh, less well-defined lamina and then you have uh, near oh, the sides here. That's a good word here. for me. L lamina? Yeah, layers. Oh, lamina, La layers. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. So you've heard that the brain is six layers, the cortex, but it's not exactly true. Uh, you see simple brain areas where you can really only distinguish three or four layers, and then you have classic neocortex with six. Yeah, yeah. And, but in V1, for instance, you could almost delineate seven layers. Um, but um, so you have this gradation of structure yeah. where the um, areas like the, the DLPFC, the dorsolateral prefrontal, which is involved in a lot of higher cognitive uh, tasks and working memory, has very sharply defined layers. Whereas these simpler areas which interface with the, the uh, emotion related areas don't have that sort of sharp lamina structure, not as sharp. And um, so my lab started looking into the connections with the amygdala uh, and now we're looking at the hippocampal co uh, connections uh, and we're very interested in wh what that has to do with uh, emotional disorders, psychiatric disorders. Um, for instance, we were looking into 
PTSD, uh, I, schizophrenia, I recently published something on that. And right now we're looking into uh, the depression, which also seems to involve these areas. And okay, so right b before we get into the depression and schizophrenia, PTSD, which we're very excited um, to get in there. So this is a neural anatomy lab. Yeah. And so r you, you started kind of um, pointing out how different brain regions have different anatomies, and so mm -hmm. you're modeling those anatomies. Yeah. And then you're building out this comprehensive model of neural anatomy, and then also you guys couple that with technologies like EEG and fMRI and, and monitor the way that neural activity works yes. in with your neural anatomy models. Yeah, so my lab doesn't do recording. So what I try to do as kind of the resident theoretician is to tie some of the, the structural uh, data with the findings from uh, labs that do behavioral assessments or electrophysiology, like recording oh. from individual cells or from, like EEG is kind of a more fuzzy measure. So, so one big task for computational people is to put together all these disparate oh. pieces, the puzzle pieces of, of neuroscience and, and try to tie them together. It's still okay. early days. so. Oh, I always say my models are toy models. They're, they're much more simplified than even what we know about the brain, but in order to make things tractable, you kind of have to simplify. Okay, yeah, correct, definitely. And that's as a synthesis, I'm doing that all the time. Exactly, yeah. So, so then you are, you're, you're synthesizing what a lot of the neural activity data is showing from the electrophysiology data that you're getting. Exactly. And then you're making um, also uh, comparisons of that data to what you're seeing in behavior. Exactly. Okay, cool, cool. All right, all right. So, um, so walk us through, um, if this was cool, um, you know, we, we've talked with, you know, Dr. Adam Gazelli and other neuroscientists about top-down processing versus bottom-up processing, mm -hmm. which is a fascinating way of thinking about the way that we um, have our cognition occurring. Um, but I like the way that you said um, we want to have an amygdala that's working for us. So a coordination versus a suppression. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, teach us about this. So I can, I can uh, introduce it by talking about uh, a model that we uh, published a, a couple of years ago called the Emotional Gatekeeper. Um, so my lab, a few years uh, before I joined the lab, discovered uh, a connection uh, of the amygdala that wasn't known in any species between the amygdala and a region called the thalamic reticular nucleus, the TRN. So deep in the middle of the brain, there's a structure called the thalamus, and sitting on top of it, there's this inhibitory a thin layer of inhibitory neurons that's been described as an inhibitory veil. It, it inhibits the thalamus, it receives excitation from thalamus and cortex, and it, it regulates the input from thalamus going to cortex. Mm -hmm. And Francis Crick, for example, was very interested in this structure, and he described it as potentially an attentional searchlight. So it seems to be a potent mechanism for filtering and, uh, the information that reaches cortex. Mm. So what might uh, a, a connection from the amygdala be doing? Uh, our model uh, tied together uh, some data suggesting that this could be a way for emotionally salient, important information, both positive emotion related and negative, to seize attention. Um, so yes. it's a way for, the, for emotions to get access to, to be a gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. So if the TRN is like a gate, you want a bunch of different gatekeepers, you know, the pass, passport please, papers please. So you want important things to get through yes. and reach the brain. And because there's so much information yeah. in the environment, uh, you can't just let everything through. As, yeah. as far as we know, uh, the brain really likes to keep uh, to a minimum what is available to the decision related areas in the brain. So we so can say right now we're taking in you know, so much visual stimuli, so much auditory stimuli, even taste and touch stimuli. Exactly. But we're only, because we're in conversation together, we're really hyper-focusing what we're exactly. on our conversation. Exactly. And, but at the same time, you want to be, if someone screams for help, we, we should probably well, interrupt the interview and go help go them. Go help them, um, yes. And, and so a, a structure like, so this projection from the amygdala can do, uh, could mediate that type of, yeah. of interaction. So that would be a for what, what in the model we call bottom-up uh, emotional filter, f um, filtering. So uh, even if you're not expecting uh, a particular emotional s uh, stimulus, you need to be able to attend to them. Yeah. At the same time, there's connections from the amygdala to cortex and cortex back to amygdala. So here, 
if, you, if let's say you have a, a strong plan, you could use this amygdala cortex amygdala TRN projection to lock out irrelevant um, uh, stimuli, even if they are emotionally important. Oh. So let's say you're really focusing on something important and you can't be too bothered by the dog barking or, or something like that. Like the elevator. Well, the elevator, elevator right now, yeah. If you have a strong emotional association with elevators, maybe. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> so, yes. so, uh, so, so that's an example of a top-down effect that um, it could be useful in some situations. We're like quelling that. Exactly. Yeah. So even though it's emotionally arousing and is exciting the amygdala, we're using the amygdala to suppress other competing emotional um, stimuli. But it's the thalamus that's, dis that's dis part of the decision as well? The, the well, there's a lot of debate about what exactly the thalamus is doing. It has for years been described as a relay, yeah, yeah. which is kind of you know underselling what it does. But we still don't have a good story. But it's it's sort of like the um, entry point of a lot of ec information, uh, both from the outside world and from cortical processing itself, to propagate to the cortex. So this is a way, uh, almost like the reception center, the the, yes, the amygdala yes. is one of the receptionists potentially al allowing things in. To the cortex. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. And and then um, in in a classic model of uh, of uh, of wanting to have better coordination with um, the prefrontal infrastructure with an amygdala, um, something like a meditation, as we were talking mm -hmm. about before the interview, that it almost f really does feel like processes like meditation uh, give one a greater coordination with the amygdala it right. feels like it feels like we regain control over what is normally just draws us to a reaction immediately right. but rather we can more easily slow down breathe cognize right. and then move from there so so can you just give us a bit on what um what, what is is that a is that, a, is that a conversation that's happening between amygdala and prefrontal? Is that a conversation that's happening between them? Mm -hmm. That's a good way to put it. Uh, the, so the amygdala has bidirectional connections with di uh, a couple of different limbic prefrontal areas. And so, and there seems to be the potential for a kind of push-pull in the sense that uh, the amygdala can excite the cortex, but the cortex and the cortex can excite the amygdala. Okay but the cortex can also inhibit. So there's two classes of cells, excitatory and inhibitory. So the cortex, uh, so different cortices have different relationships with the inhibitory neurons in the amygdala. Uh, and this can be a, a powerful way to uh, regulate how strongly the amygdala uh, produces its uh, uh, signals, for instance, to the TRN and elsewhere. So. Uh, a lot of the fear-related reactions that we have, like in rodents, there's a freezing reaction. Uh, they just stop moving. But, and humans don't always do that, but, but a lot of those reactions are generated by the amygdala going downstream to other uh, parts of the, of, the, uh, of the nervous system. And uh, regulating when that happens is a good idea. So you need the amygdala to tar uh, filter salient things, both good and bad, dangerous and safe. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you don't always want to immediately react to them. Yes, so yes. when you talk about coordination, one thing that seems to be useful is use the amygdala to, for the information involved in what's important and what's not in the environment, but don't necessarily react immediately. So you want the best of both worlds. You want that filtering signal. You want that alarm signal, if you like. But you don't want the uh, knee-jerk reactions. Mm -hmm. And here's where a combination of excitation and inhibition, the right balance yeah. seems to be important. And it can go both ways, excitation and inhibition mm -hmm. from yeah. frontal cortex to amygdala. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not always easy to map these directly onto this circuit, but you could, like for instance, uh, you could have a reaction to some, like pain or something, so that's coming bottom up. But you could also have a reaction to uh, a sad story. And, and, oh. and that could come down to oh. the amygdala and produce reactions that feel a lot like physical pain to some people. Oh. Um, you know, your chest could start hurting, yeah. breathing will get uh, altered. So we, it's well known that for uh, humans, a lot of emotional pain uh, resembles physical pain. Uh, and at the same time, 
let's say you're very angry, uh, let, let's say someone cuts you off uh, in uh, traffic and you're kind of angry. If, for instance, you find out that there was a pregnant woman in the back and they were rushing to the hospital, a lot of people, their anger will dissipate fairly quickly. Mm. So th that's an example of you know cognition and emotion having that kind of more damping down effect fairly rapidly in some cases. Yes, yes. So um, many yeah. interesting examples mm -hmm. about the way that the amygdala um, interplays, communicates with other brain regions. And um, okay, so then that's on um, a lot of the uh, the amygdala side of things. Now I want to hear on the computational psychiatry side of things, on the hippocampal side of things, on the. Um, you recently published on schizophrenia mm -hmm. in December, um, and also you're pursuing um, aspects of depression and disorders related to that. So let's venture into this. Excellent. So computational psychiatry is uh, a newish subfield uh, of neuroscience. And uh, similar to the story with neuroscience, I hadn't really heard of it uh, for a while. And, and then, in fact, someone contacted me because of Quora to ask me what computational neuroscience was. And then I was like, I don't really know what that is, but I think I could guess. <laughs> and, and so I met this, this uh, um, person and talked about it. And then, uh, because I'm studying the limbic system, the amygdala and all these emotion related areas, it, it was a, a natural outgrowth of that to start talking about disorders uh, in these models. So it's not just about successful filtering, but also, well, what, what can go wrong? There's many ways that things that could, get, can go wrong. And that allows us to not just ask what are the correlates, like which area is involved, but why. So, so, for, so in the case of schizophrenia, it's again this uh, circuit involving the TRN, this thin layer of inhib inhibitory neurons, and the thalamus and the cortex. So we were just focusing on what else we could say about this three area uh, circuit. It's a, it's a generic circuit, so for different systems, uh, you have the same kind of motif. We call it a circuit motif. And so, um, uh, schizophrenia is a very complicated disorder and no one has really found a definitive cause or even a definitive correlate but in recent years one line of uh, research experimentalists have uncovered is I dysfunctional inhibition. So there's local inhibition in the cortex and tamping things down then there's the TRN itself which has been linked with uh, schizophrenia. So, so we thought let's look at this circuit and see what it can do and what can go wrong. So when you're making a computational model, you need to pick a behavior that is tractable. Like modeling hallucinations would be cool, but it's very difficult because you know, we really don't understand how language is generated. So getting to that is, is too complicated. So what we found, I, I was quite intrigued to learn that a few years ago that uh, one of the most uh, um, readily identifiable symptoms of schizophrenia is uh, disordered eye movements. So schizophrenia patients, and sometimes their close relatives, have uh, an inability to fix their eyes on a target. Uh, and for instance, you could have a, sc uh, a dot on a screen that's moving around. And, and uh, healthy controls, they can follow along that dot just fine, like going in a figure of eight, for instance. Um, whereas with a, a schizophrenia patient, their, their eyes will often be quite erratic. And there was a paper showing that mm. a machine learning method involving a couple of eye movement uh, tasks, just using those, could tell um, schizophrenia patients and their close relatives from controls with something like above 95% accuracy. Wow. So it's a diagnostic symptom, uh, uh, very useful for you know, at-risk uh, populations and for the patients themselves. Um, wow. And so the question is, well, what's producing this, uh, this symptom, yes. and m might that shed light on other symptoms? Yes. So I set up a circuit involving a simplified version of the, the three brain regions, cortex, TR, and thalamus, and I made a simple eye tracking uh, um, model that, that uses the, this kind of circuit to uh, maintain a, a, a target at the center of attention. Um, and what we saw is that these uh, disrupting a couple of different classes of inhibition could produce this erratic behavior. And so, so, so that's something that experimentalists can now maybe work with. We showed that different inter, uh, disruptions could look vaguely similar, but also have differences. So this ties into the idea that schizophrenia and potentially other disorders 
may not just be one disorder. They may be a family of disorders with different causes that seem outwardly similar. Mm -hmm. And I think this is very important going forward for the field. And I think the field is more and more acknowledging this. So apart from that diversity of causes story, one idea that we elaborate in the discussion section is, is the idea that um, going off track uh, is uh, maybe a feature of other symptoms of schizophrenia. So one symptom uh, is having disordered thoughts. So it may be that uh, if you can't track uh, a dot, some, if that similar disruption is going on elsewhere, it's, you're not able to follow a, th uh, a context relevant set of thoughts. So the same disruption going on in an analogous circuit might prevent uh, uh, someone from holding on to a th the line of thinking and sort of jumping from one thing to the other. So it's an interesting way of uh, looking at how a simple local circuit disruption can have these uh, widespread effects uh, in different systems. Okay, this example was... Oh, now I'm thinking my imagination is roaring about all these other potential diagnostic methods mm -hmm. that don't yet exist that yeah. we're that we're going to be able to figure out and leverage machine learning to be able to more effectively um, figure it out. Right, right, um, yeah. And then also when you're when you're explaining um, this potential um, that. Uh, that something as complex as a, as a schizophrenia could potentially be a myriad of different um, involvement um, in different brain regions. This exactly, is, this yeah. is a very complicated, um, <clears throat> and this is all the way to when a humans even in the womb and then they're born and like there's you know foundational infrastructures that get laid out at, during that time period and how that interplays with their adolescent and adult life. Exactly. Then. Yeah. Um, Okay, I have I have a I have a question pre as we get into um, depression. I want to ask about um, schizophrenia. Um, I've had several conversations um, with people about how um, we may all be uh, the spectrum of schizophrenia potentially, mm -hmm. uh, from a good schizophrenia to a bad potentially schizophrenia, and okay. how um, uh, in at in 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 what what we've created with hyper realities where um it like a santa claus is kind of like a hyper reality we've made up a story okay and we and we call it real mm -hmm. and then pe we tell some people tell their kids that that's real yeah. and there's cookies and stuff and, mm -hmm. and sliding down the chimney with presents and mm -hmm. all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff mm -hmm. reindeer etc and um <clears throat> and then it almost gets you know in a sense there's this these two competing realities Right. That are then occurring, right. mm -hmm. and so um, for f and and some people even say um, one of the most um, uh, potentially uh, one of the greatest measurements of of intelligence is one's ability to abstractly reason multiple perspectives, mm -hmm. multiple variables on a on a given issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, when you're doing that, what you're doing is you're trying to see how uh, like a low socioeconomic status person sees the world, how a rich person sees the world, how someone from India, how someone from Pakistan, how someone from um, different countries, also different genders, different religions, how people see the world, right? So if you're trying to balance all these perspectives and see them all, so do you see kind of where I'm coming that um, in this term? And how do you feel about all of that? So I just started reading uh, a book sort of from left field compared to the neuroscience st side. It's called the sublime object of psychiatry, it's a kind of a more a humanities approach to schizophrenia. So it describes schizophrenia as a sublime object. And what they mean by that is that schizophrenia has been defined by various fields, including biological psychiatry and psychoanalysis, as sort of beyond understanding. Uh, meaning that you can maybe study it, but you can never <laughs> empathize with, with a schizo <laughs> schizophrenia patient. It's, an it's a very strange book, but very interesting. because. Uh, I have, and you know, people can relate to this. They're like, yeah, the person when the schizophrenia patient is describing their hallucinations or their overarching world theory, you can kind of make sense of parts of it, but the whole thing, you just, it's very hard to understand what's going on with that person. So, um, <laughs> if what if I understand what you're saying correctly, perhaps some of these people are kind of torn between so many perspectives yeah. that uh, they, they um, end up with this mosaic idea that, yeah, that yeah. is 
a, pr a product of perspectives that don't even sit well together. It, it, it's a fun speculation, yeah. but you know, when you're talking yeah. about disorders, that you have to remember there's a lot of suffering involved in this, yes, and, yes. There and is. so yes, you wouldn't there you is. wouldn't wish this on anyone, uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, especially the psychosis side of things and, and yeah. catatonia. You know, and, and then there's also a way to um, to um, as one potentially experiences a psychosis from this mosaic of worldviews, let's mm -hmm, say, mm -hmm. uh, there is a way to um, live with that in a gentle way, in a way that um, creates almost a deeper degree of empathy for, for different worldviews in that sense. And so, although it can at times feel like it's a big uh, uh, taking on the burden uh, to be able to relate to all of these different worldviews, at the same time, it it makes one super well-rounded, and in that sense. But um, so it's a good. I, I, another way to view this is just the way that we use um, the social media culture, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because when you take a look at people's profiles, it's um, it's it's only almost exclusively their best selves. Sure, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and so then that becomes you know what's real in this <laughs> sense. What is actually you? Because is you really only your photos of you looking your absolute best, traveling, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. having the best meals, the best people? Is it real? No. N yeah. So, um, <coughs> because you're definitely not po posting when you feel anxiety or when you feel depressed or when you, um, you know, you're feeling a lack of love or, um, you know. So, so here's again this, this, this idea of what is reality mm -hmm. and how can... Um, how do hyper realities? How do um, um, uh, balancing mo different worldviews into a large mosaic? How do these things relate to schizophrenia? It's a fascinating question. If we're in a simulation or not, <laughs> you know, that's well, where we, you yeah, know, yeah. These, these are all yeah. hard, very, very hard questions. But what you said about empathy, I think, can okay, help please, maybe yes. ground this in something. So I read a few years ago a fascinating paper on schizophrenia in different cultures. So it, I, I believe it was called Hearing Voices in uh, I think Africa, or in Ghana and China, like there was an African city and an Indian city, <coughs> excuse me. And the, uh, it w I discovered it through a blog called Neuroanthropology, mm. which, uh, so the point of the paper was that uh, it's widely uh, believed that schizophrenia is a fairly universal disorder affecting around 1% of people worldwide, but the specific manifestations of it can be quite different. So meaning the content of the hallucinations is different. <coughs> so um, in different parts of the world, like for instance, apparently in the West and in America, a lot of the uh, voices uh, are uh, potentially giving sort of violent instructions of some sort. Whereas apparently in India, some, the voices sometimes are a motherly voice telling you to clean up your room. <laughs> so. So there's that difference. Then there's also the, the way in which society responds to the person having hallucinations. So the paper talked about how in certain tribes, they frame this having of hallucinatory voices in terms of possession. So a spirit is possessing you. And interestingly, uh, you might think, well, that's unscientific, it's nonsense. But it, this may actually help reintegrate people into society. Because uh, when the person is not hearing voices or acting weird, uh, their belief is, well, they can come join work because the spirit isn't with them today. And allowing people to be in society and be a productive member of society is really important. And one of the things you, you read, for instance, in that book I mentioned earlier, uh, is that schizophrenia is sometimes defined in terms of inability to contribute to uh, useful work. So there's a capitalist element to mm -hmm. who we decide is like incapable of being useful. So the way that society responds... And responds in what sense? Because if you give them a big uh, paint uh, kit or... Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Who well, knows? you know, I, I often wonder if, you know, in, in early, and this is a popular idea, that in earlier generations, people who were prophets or maybe shaman might have been what we would now call schizophrenia uh, patients. So, um, so how the culture responds uh, is important. And also how they tell people... So for a long time in America, there was an instruction to patients to ignore the hallucinations. Whereas what you said about empathy is very relevant because some places they instruct uh, patient, patients to listen to their, not act on everything that the voice tells them to do if but they're listen. telling them to do things. Yeah. But you could 
in the spirit of empathy towards people outside, these constructed people that yeah. may exist in you are in a sense um, perspectives. They might not be correct or accurate, yes, correct. but as with most people, people just want to be heard yeah. and, and given some kind of consideration. You don't have to list, act on every piece of advice you receive, but yeah. giving them the, the time to be heard yeah. is a great way to diffuse frustration and tension rather than ignoring people. Yes. So, um, so, so empathy towards oneself may be important too, yeah. or, or, or one's selves. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is this has been such a fascinating back and forth on on schizophrenia, and I really am so interested in it. Um, okay, now let's get into um, the aspects of depression and disorders with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, I've just recently started looking into this <coughs> as a result of. So my lab has been sort of expanding outwards this uh, understanding of the limbic circuit. We started with these medial and orbital prefrontal areas and the amygdala. And now we're looking at the ventral hippocampus, which is a very emotion related area. And the fourth region, so I like to think of the limbic system in terms of the four pillars of it being medial prefrontal areas, the amygdala, the ventral hippocampus, and the nucleus accumbens, which is one of the areas in the basal ganglia, which is you know, uh, strongly in involved in reward based learning and things like that. So uh, with these four areas, you kind of have a motivation circuit. Uh, you have emotional salience, you have top down plans and medial prefrontal is complicated, but it seems to be involved in things like <coughs> detecting conflict and error and, and sort of notifying the rest of the brain that something's going wrong. The hippocampus seems to be involved, as, as everyone knows, uh, with memory and also with context and navigation. So these areas seem to interact, they have strong connections with each other um, uh, to kind of help an organism decide on a course of action. Uh, in the case of the hippocampus, this seems to involve uh, comparing, uh, deciding what context you're in. Is it a safe context? Mm -hmm. Is it a context where it's worthwhile to uh, seek rewards? Uh, invest time to invest time in something or is it a time to be vigilant and uh, so what we're looking into is the idea that at least some forms of depression involve abnormal context processing wow so it's the four pillars have an abnormal communication yes and and so the the, the areas that one fo can focus on uh, are well ec any so because these are complicated networks uh, any a disruption in pretty much any node could cause a problem and, and outwardly you might not know which node has been disrupted. So which is why we, we, we can think about a spectrum of depression-like behaviors. They may not all res, um, arise from the same disruption. Uh, but so when you're looking at the hippocampus, a lot, there's a lot of data on the hippocampus being involved in depression, but the question is why? So. Uh, so this is what I'm working on currently. So you know, ask me in a year what if uh, we will, what, we'll the model, uh, what the model what the model is. But yes. but the, 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 the shape that I, I'm trying to uh, take it is that uh, memory of the past and anticipation of the future seem to involve the same region, uh, the hippocampus, and closely related areas. And you might ask why. Um, so one way you could understand the purpose of memory is to anticipate the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it's great to have memories just to reflect on, oh, remember that time. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, if we're being good biologists, we have to look at everything from yeah. the perspective of evolution. Yes. So, now what does that mean? That means that, at least in principle, <coughs> once upon a time, traits related to memory had a purpose. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, Selecting, uh, comparing the present to the past in order to choose a course for the future yes. is a way to link all these things together. Now, what does that have to do with depression? depression yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems as though depression is, or th uh, there's many forms of it. Some of them involve demotivation. So the un it's not so much about sadness, although sadness can be involved, as it is an unwillingness to take action. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, so y there may be something good just on the horizon, yes. uh, but they don't seem to be able yes. to get out of bed to act on that. Yes. They may be cognitively aware of the opportunity, yes. but it doesn't land with the uh, drive to act on it. So one possibility that we're thinking about is that, uh, and it's not just me, a, a, a lot of researchers have looked into this, but one possibility is that uh, there's an overgeneralization of a bad context, 
one in which there aren't opportunities. Like maybe you had a couple of bad days. Uh, people who are optimistic wake up in the morning and today is not going to be like yesterday. Even if they've had 10 days in a row of bad days. Uh, and that's a great form of resilience mm -hmm. to say that today will be different from yesterday. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this may be disrupted for various reasons. There could be prior trauma and one big factor, long-term stress. Uh. Unavoidable stress is the worst thing in, in terms of human health. Um, and the basic physiological needs not being met is one of the worst ways to induce stress. Yes, and you know, but you know what's worse? Social stress. Oh. How humans treat each other oh. is the number one stressor. Yeah. So be nice to people, <laughs> because yeah. um, because that. Uh, so Robert Sapolsky talks about. He has this awesome uh, data about baboons, and how there's a particular tribe in in uh, Kenya that they have so much access to basic physiological needs like food and water that they have plenty of time to be cruel to each other. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 the uh, baboons at the bottom of the pyramid, the male baboons have the worst uh, stress-related factors and that affects things like propensity to put on weight and all kinds of factors like that. Whereas the animals near the top uh, are m uh, much better in terms of stress. So stress can be one way that a system, for instance, of memory and context becomes biased towards negative context. So there uh, needs to be some sort of a, f of a self actualization and a self-transcendence, some sort of a meaning and purpose and fulfillment past basic physiological needs. And usually that means in a social setting that you have these powerful social connections and that you have a goal that you're doing every yeah. day and that you're, these four pillars are able to talk to each other well about getting, you seeing that opportunity and then seizing it and going forth yeah. for it. Yeah, so at least some forms of depression involve uh, a difficulty in either recognizing or enabling a good context to drive behavior. So it's, it's, it's a double tragedy because it's, it's not that they don't believe that there are goals out there, they might have goals, but it's like some sort of access problem, like the goal isn't reaching, um, you know, isn't motivating. So how to d treat it is very complicated uh, and so one of the reasons that, that we, we need to develop a model and uh, is to understand all these different antidepressant treatments, why do they sometimes work with some groups and not others? Uh, and why is there still this treatment resistant depression population? So once we have a circuit model, we can look at different kinds of defects and see, well, which treatments might compensate for which defects. And then we, in future, uh, we might even be able to target things much better if we can find behavioral uh, clues for, well, this is depression type A or depression type B. That would be ideal. Well, uh, I can't promise yeah. anything like that anytime soon, but that's the yes. goal of theoretical neuroscience. Yeah. Fascinating, yeah. Which is one yeah. of the goals. Yeah. Yes, yeah, totally. If you can maybe, uh, you know, find a, a power law distribution in, in depression and, and identify that a lot of cases follow A, type A, let's say, or, a, yeah. or yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and type B is less, and it's like, it looks like this, et cetera. Yeah. Um, actually, what you're teaching about, um, about memory, the use of memory is something that we find very fascinating mm -hmm. um, in um, that, you know, and the way that, you know, what you, the sleep's involvement in that process as well. Mm. Um, and just uh, if, if one's um, ability to look at um, um, the stimuli that they've collected throughout their lives as, as their memory, and then how a computer carries almost 100% retention of memory, whereas we carry whatever way less um, of, 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 of a stimuli that we've absorbed, right? So like an, a robotic uh, intelligent perception could carry almost infinite if it's being, you know, stored. In. Um, and it's so crazy how uh, we then compute the day's stimuli uh, with our storage of memory and then figure out what the best future actions are to take that whole um, that feedback system that we have mm -hmm. is so freaking crazy yes <laughs> crazy is but yeah and you know it's good that you mentioned the computer because um, it's very popular to understand human memory in terms of computer memory but it's also very important to understand why they are wildly different mm -hmm. like for instance in a hard drive as you pack it with memory 
eventually it starts to do worse, like the, the more memories it holds. Uh, but whereas with human memory, the more links you have, the better your memory is because you can make more connections. So associative memory is very different from As computer memory. Associative memory yeah. it would be like if the memory of the computer was learning. Exactly. While you, and so the, the term that's used in computer science and machine learning is content addressable memory. We haven't made particularly good content addressable memory. And what that, so it's, what, what does that mean? It's, it's that uh, if, if I talk about, say, a Beatles song, I have all kinds of related information near the address of the Beatles. <laughs> yes, yes. Whereas if I have a folder full of MP3s of the Beatles, I can't be like, well, which are the songs that are about uh, such and such topic? Or which, which are the ones that are... That's because unless I saved it with, with well, tags or something tags. in the first place, the, wow. like, have you ever tried to search on an unindexed uh, file system. It's so <laughs> bad. So this is interesting. You're talking about querying your own memory versus on a computer. Yeah. Sending a query is yeah. so much harder. But but um, for for the files that you've indexed locally, but sending a query to a, a search engine uh, mm -hmm. is well, like different, yeah. wow. Because uh, we're doing the connect associating. Yeah, we're doing the associating. Like yeah, we're yeah. doing the work yeah, yeah. for Google. Like yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow. So. <laughs> Wow, wow. And then it's it's almost as though every single then um, Gmail address that is linked as it's making queries is then creating this massive um, yeah, interplay between the, the one that's making the queries and the actual database, but exactly. then also building out the massive model of what that what the queries have been happening and then exactly. predicting about what's gonna be of interest yeah. and all that type of stuff. But my favorite version of this is, is, which is very mysterious and I have no idea how to, how, how to model it, is let's say you've heard a, a bunch of music and you have that in your memory somewhere and someone introduces you to a new term, let's say a genre name. You can retroactively say that, oh, that song I heard a month ago is in this genre. So this new information can, can immediately kind of go work back with prior memories. Yes. So you can take new information and completely recontextualize, reorder, refile old memories. On the fly, with no effort. <laughs> yeah, with no <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, yeah, that's um, that's like when you, you uh, when maybe you um, experience some uh, profound awareness shift in a scientific field or something, and yeah. then you re you go back and you and you you realize that the way you were maybe storing the 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 knowledge before could be updated in such a cool way with the new information that it like makes it m m more easy to recall the exactly. wider uh, knowledge basis. Yeah. Wow. That that was such a profoundly fascinating conversation. I loved it. Awesome. That was so cool on all things neural circuitry of emotion. And also, I want to ask you a couple uh, quick questions on the way out of the show, like we like to ask on every episode, two of them. Okay. First question is, are we in a simulation? I find the, th the thought somewhat meaningless in the sense that I don't think it matters because we can't step out of it, uh, so whatever we see is the, the real world for all practical purposes. So it's fun to speculate about, but I don't think it can ever have any consequences for our decisions or even for our experience, really. It's a bit like, you know, uh, the new version of uh, are all of us in the dream of Vishnu kind of thing, you know, like uh, it's, an, it's just another version of that. Uh, Until we can actually poke with a scientific probe at the simulation and also make our own simulation so we get to you know do both experiments at the same time potentially the and up one is a bit harder the but up the one's yeah. way <laughs> harder i don't know whether it's even possible but whether it's even possible <laughs> yeah. we'll have to figure out nothing potentially is impossible let's Fair. See. Okay. We'll, we'll Fair see we'll see who knows who knows um, okay and then the last question is what is the most beautiful thing in the world it's a very hard question, but I'm going to say, hmm, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. I don't know whether it's beautiful or not, but I love analogies, metaphors and analogies. And it's almost not just beautiful in itself, but it's one of the ways by which we can access many forms of beauty. And the more you study it, the more beautiful it becomes in itself, uh, partly because of the mystery of it. Like, 
show me the machine learning model that can produce and understand analogies. <laughs> then we'll have artificial intelligence. <laughs> yeah, and as a synthesist, metaphors and analogies are so crucial. And if, you can, if we can refine something of sheer vast complexity into a very powerful metaphor, mm -hmm. Uh, like right now, we've been working so much with this idea of a tree of possibility mm -hmm. and the seed. So that every mind, every child is a seed born into the world that needs the right nutrients in the root system, the basic physiological needs in order for it to flourish and have lots of fruit for the community, family, and world. And then also the tree of possibility that there's so many different roads that the seed can take in its life. The jobs it takes, the interests that it takes, the people it marry, it set that you marry, children that you have, all this type of stuff where mm -hmm, you live. Mm -hmm. So these analogies and metaphors, they can drive e expanded states of awareness awareness um, in such a simple form that can get passed on for uh, potentially centuries. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yeah. yeah, I'm really happy that you said that. It was the first time we've heard that as the most beautiful thing in the world, metaphors really? and analogies. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was the first time we heard wow. that. Okay. Johan, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you, Alan. This was great. <laughs> this is such a pleasure, brother. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I really hope that everyone that watched, that you guys had a great time. Please let us know your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Go and share this type of content with other people. Get talking to more people about our brain regions, how we interact with the world, what that means for ourselves and for our friends and communities and our what we what we what we seek as as our as our ultimate callings in life and also support the people that you believe in johan's links are below support him follow him also simulations links are below support the artists and entrepreneurs and the organizations around the world that you believe in and go and build the future everyone manifest your dreams into the world thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you soon peace